This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing as Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like Knowing Animals. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Did you know that I'm one of the people who manages the ASA Facebook page? So if you see posts going up on the ASA Facebook page, it could be my posts. So please think about signing up to the Facebook page and perhaps a little bit more important than that, think about joining ASA. ASA relies on membership subs to do its work of supporting animal studies scholars. So if you're not a member of ASA, you should think about joining. This episode is also brought to you by Animal Publix. Now, have you checked out Animal Publix online? They are a publisher. They're part of the University of Sydney Press, Sydney University Press. They are a series of books with an animal focus, very, very much talking to animal studies scholars from animal studies scholars. Some of them are politics-focused books. Some of them are historical books. Some of them are works of literature but all of them have a really strong animal focus. So if you haven't checked out Animal Publix yet, you must check them out online. That's part of the University of Sydney Press. Okay, let's get down to the business. Now, this week I'm really pleased to uh, be joined by Dr. Rosalind Appleby. I'm in her office, which is at UTS. Ros is Senior Lecturer in Applied Languages and Literature Studies at the Faculty of Arts at UTS in Sydney Town, right in the heart of the city. And today we're going to discuss Ros's brand new book, which is called Sexing the Animal in a Post-Humanist World, which was public. It was published by Routledge in 2019. And I should say off the bat that if you um, are at a university, either as staff or student, have a think about ordering the book. It's really wonderful if the people who come on this show uh, are supported by having the books that they're talking about and that they've written purchased at their institution, at your institution's library. Of course, if you can afford to buy it yourself, all the better. But if not, ask your library to purchase a copy. Anyway, enough of that. Welcome to the podcast, Roz. Thank you. Okay, Roz, tell us what what inspired this, why this piece of work? Um, Well, I should explain at the outset that the book is a series of essays and each essay is about um, human interactions with sharks. So sometimes I think I should have just called the book Swimming with Sharks. So uh, the reason why I became interested in this topic is that seven years ago I took up ocean swimming as a sport. And so every day at, say, six or seven o'clock in the morning, I'm lucky enough to swim in an aquatic reserve um, between Manly Beach and Shelley Beach. And every day we see lots of fish, lots of different sorts of fish that I've come to know. And we also see sharks that come in seasonal patterns throughout the year. But um, shortly after I took up ocean swimming, uh, there were pro-shark rallies across Australia and these were in response to the shark culling measures that were instituted by the Western Australian government where they were catching and killing sharks. And the pro-shark rallies that were at Manly where I swim were um, intent on having the government remove the shark nets so it wasn't just the sort of active shark culling that we saw in Western Australia but the removal of the shark nets which have been there ever since I was a child and I was unsure about that. Um, I was happy to swim with the sharks that I saw every day, Port Jacksons, Wobbegongs, Dusky Whalers in their seasonal patterns but I really wasn't sure about the sharks that I couldn't see, which were possibly right out beyond those shark nets. So that sort of piqued my curiosity and my research has always been driven by personal curiosity and a need to know something 
that I don't already know. Um, then also about that time, um, sharks seem to be having a moment. Um, in 2014 and 2015, there was a spike in human interactions with sharks, um, an unusually high number of interactions in Australia. Also, 2015 was the 40th anniversary of JAWS, which, as we know, is the sort of seminal shark text, at least in our culture, in so white Western culture. Um, and then um, there was a particular event in South African waters, which also was part of this sort of peak shark phenomenon. And that was when Mick Fanning, who was um, competing in the World Surfing League Championships off the coast of South Africa, was, uh, he had an event with a shark, shall we say. It was a great white shark. Um, and what made this event particularly spectacular was that it was live broadcast, which of course is extremely rare. I don't know of any other time where there's been a shark attack, in quotation marks, that's been filmed live and, and broadcast. So you can see, everybody can see that on YouTube. Um, so all this sort of seemed to come together with my own personal interest in sharks. Um, the other aspect of the book is, um, or the, the subtitle is, A Critical Feminist Perspective. And when I started following up on the sorts of texts that describe these events, like the Mick Fanning event, um, what I saw was that they were written and shaped in a particular way through a sort of um, feminist, well, a, a cultural politics around gender and sexuality. So if you have a look at those um, newspaper or news media reports of that Mick Fanning event, what you see is that Mick Fanning, through no intent of his own, I'm sure, comes out of it as this great white hero. The shark, of course, is this monster with razor sharp teeth. The shark has all those sort of traditional ways of describing sharks and shark activity in Australian media. Um, but Mick Fanning, through this event, is presented as the great white hero. Now, this sort of um, cultural politics of gender and sexuality comes out very strongly in all the texts that I looked at, well, most of the texts that I looked at, um, and then became the basis of each of the essays that appear in the book. Wonderful. So... How important for your study is it that you actually know sharks somewhat yourself? Um, well, as I said, that, that is the sort of grounding of the book. The whole reason for the book, the motivation for the book, comes from my personal interest in sharks and my wanting to know more about them, about the way they interact with us about um, the way that they're represented to humans which is um, more to do with human ideas than of course with the sharks themselves. Sharks are absolutely fascinating creatures. Um, they've been evolving over 400 million years. They're older than the dinosaurs. They're older than trees. Um, and they're our link to a Jurassic past. And in some ways, when I think about that um, evolution, I think, well, in fact, they're more highly evolved than we are. They are the perfect creatures for the environment in which they live. Um, there's, I think, over 450 species of different sharks um, the Greenland shark, I think, lives to about 400 years old. Of course, they're not exactly sure, but really, really old. 
and um, there's just so many fascinating things about sharks. They're also absolutely crucial for ocean health. Because they're at the top of the food chain, um, healthy sharks means healthy oceans. Mm. Interesting. So is it fair to say that you believe that sharks are talking to us or we can communicate with sharks and can you say something about what form that takes and what we've learned or could learn perhaps Mm. um i don't know that i would say that sharks are communicating with us there's a common misconception that there are rogue sharks that take a particular dislike of humans um, and that's the sort of jaws trope and that this rogue shark will come after humans. Um, That's just not accurate. Um, And in fact, one of the things that really attracts me about sharks is that they just don't care about us. They really just don't care. Um, I can remember one of the first times I ever saw a grey nurse shark Uh, And when I was growing up, grey nurse sharks were something to be really, really feared. But over the years, um, they've been hunted and they're now a threatened species. Um, And so when we have the odd grey nurse in the aquatic reserve where I swim, everybody's, all my swimming friends, of course, are really excited to see this shark. But it's quite clear that the shark just does not care about us. They want us to leave them alone to do their own thing. So are they communicating with us? I think they try not to. (laughs) It's mostly humans who are bothering the sharks rather than the other way around. I mean, there's only an average of one or two um, shark-related fatalities in Australia every year. And if you compare that with the number of sharks that are killed every year, um, that's absolutely minuscule or the number of humans who die through other means so there's over 200 people who die in Australia every every year through drowning and many more through road accidents but um, if there's one shark related fatality of course there's a total media frenzy around that Um, so I should say I, I looked not just at news media and the way the news media represent the sharks but also I looked at um, the history of Western painting where sharks feature. I looked at film, including Jaws, but also more recent films. And I also looked at the way that science represents sharks all through, also through these sort of normative views of um, gender and sexuality, which seems sort of strange to say, but it's there in the science literature. Mm-hmm. So how then does that gender and sexuality aspect express itself? Um, Well, if we think of one of the earliest um, paintings that I looked at, um, which are paintings of um, Andromeda and the shark and uh, Perseus rescuing Andromeda. So um, these are paintings by many of um, the western canon by people like Titian for example so in those paintings we see Andromeda naked and chained to a rock and we see um, the uh, sea monster which I interpret as um, uh, a sort of early rendition of sharks um, and Perseus uh, coming down from the heavens brandishing a sword and ready to slay the sea monster or the shark and rescue the female victim. And this sort of uh, notion of a masculine um, uh, idea of human heroism in the face of a sort of raw nature expressed through the body of the shark is a common trope that appears throughout Western arts. We saw it in Jaws. We see it in um, Damien Hirst's Shark, um, a a famous installation by Damien Hirst. And, of course, that gender expression then 
as I said, is we also see in science reporting. Do you want me to give you an instance? Yeah, of I'd that? like to hear yeah. about it in science reporting, please. Yeah. Okay. So, um, scientists are very interested in sharks, but we don't, in fact, know a lot about them because they are quite elusive creatures. And as I said, you know, they're not interested in us. Shark uh, scientists are interested in sharks, but sharks are not interested. <laughs> people doing science. <laughs> so there's a couple of articles that look at the migration of great white sharks from um, South Africa to the west coast uh, and around the south coast of Australia. So these are great transoceanic migrations. And one of the earliest studies, and I'm talking about uh, maybe early 21st century was looking at this migration and um, they saw that it involved um, um, it was part of the story of uh, sexual reproduction and they assumed through with no evidence that it was the male sharks who were undertaking this huge transoceanic migration from South Africa to Australia, um, breeding there and then returning to South African waters. And these were known as roving males and non-roving females. So um, we can see there the ideas of a sort of normative and conservative human sexuality being projected onto these sharks. But a study not long after that had more advanced methods of tagging and tracking those sharks and they worked out that it was actually the females who were the roving sharks <laughs> and they would undertake these fantastic transoceanic migrations. They'd have sex with a shark in a different population in a different part of the world and then return to South Africa to, to have the, their babies, their baby sharks. So that's just one example um, of the way that science uh, projects onto creatures, and it's certainly sharks aren't the only ones, but it does happen with shark populations, project onto sharks these ideas of human sexuality, which are unfortunately then mirrored back onto human society in a way to tell humans the way that things that um, should biologically be a sort of biosocial determinism for human gender and sexuality as well. Mm. So um, sort of capturing sharks and other creatures into that human story. <clears throat> so when you think about your research, um, you know, when you kind of zoom out a little bit and think about your research overall, what are the big lessons about human-animal relationships that you take from all this? Hmm. Um, I think, uh, well, f if I work from myself sort of outwards, I guess it's what we don't know we can be afraid of or what we don't know we can ignore to our peril and to the planet's peril. And I think... All humans can benefit from getting to know animals more, not just for our sake, but for the sake of those animals and for the sake of all those individual lives of creatures and people. Do you ever think about perhaps being taken by a shark or killed by a shark? Um, I did think about it this week when one of the paddle boards that came back into the beach just before I was about to leave the beach came into the beach with a shark tooth stuck in its hull <laughs> too much excitement but I just assumed it was one of the friendly sharks that I see one of the harmless sharks and went swimming regardless so uh, you know it I guess it occasionally crosses my mind um, but 
I, you know, I swim with over the weeks, you know, hundreds of people every day in Australia who never are fortunate enough to see a shark, let alone be attacked by one. So I think the likelihood is very, very low. (laughs) Well, Ros, I ask everyone who comes on the podcast to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? Yes. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? I'm not sure exactly, but the first one I can think of was Val Plumwood's writing about being prey to a crocodile, where she talks about being um, caught in a death roll by a crocodile and the sorts of realisations that that uh, traumatic experience um, brought to her. And there were two things. One was her realisation that humans, like all creatures, are just part of a food chain. But at the same time, she realised that we and all animals are also more than that. Each of us, um, as Tom Reagan would say, each of us is an individual subject of a life. So not only for me, but also for the crocodile or for the shark. And, I, and that, So that was, I think, the first example of pro-animal scholarship that I read. Wonderful. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? Yes, that's a bit (laughs) easier. Um, I wrote about my dog at that time, whose name was Sister. And I wrote about that in 2012 for an anthology that was put together by a veterinary studies program in Canada. Um, And it was about my relationship with my dog. Um, And I inherited this dog as an elderly um, female dog and she had to get to know me and one of the things that really struck me because I work in language studies was the intensity with which she watched me for those first couple of days Um, and I could only assume it was so that she could read me. She understood what I was doing when, um, what my different clothes and outfits and shoes meant in terms of the routine of the household. And so I just thought that was amazing to watch her, the intensity of her relationship with me and her desire to read me um, so we could communicate in that way. So that was the first chapter I wrote about animals. Lovely. So if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Well, there's many, needless to, sta- needless to say, but, um, and of course Val Plumwood is very important, but somebody that I, I'm not sure is well known outside the language studies area, who I think has done really, really good work and quite extensive, is um, a fellow called Aaron Stibb. Um, he's a, an eco-linguistics scholar and he's written a lot about the way that language and discourse represents animals in ways that uh, lead to animal exploitation the way that human language obscures animals or erases animals from our consciousness and and can lead to animal suffering. And he also is very interested in non-Western ways of representing animals through language and he really celebrates those. So Aaron Stibb, I'd highly recommend his work to any animal studies scholars. Wow, it's great to have new names on the podcast. What institution is he at? He's in the UK, maybe Gloucester. Okay, that's okay. (laughs) People can Google it up. That's fine. So what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? Um, Look, I think academics are in a really privileged position. Um, 
and I think the best we can do is to incorporate attention to animals in all our scholarly practices. So I know a lot of the listeners to your podcast will be researchers and writers about animals and that's really important. But um, perhaps more recently I've been really interested in ways of bringing attention to animals into our teaching regardless of what the subject is and it's an interesting challenge Um, but I think we have um, as lecturers we have a unique opportunity in our teaching work to speak to people um, and people in the next generation um, about the importance of attending to animals Um, in language studies um, I practice what I preach and bring in animals at every opportunity Um, and and I think that's a really important task for academics to think about. Very, very sound advice there. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human, -human non-human animal relationship, what would it be? There's so many things, of course, that we need to change but I think one of the things that's most immediate for me, um, if I could just wave that magic wand, I would eradicate the industrial production of animals for human consumption. And that would mean put an end to factory farming and also to live animal exports. Um, we don't need to be eating animals and we certainly don't need to be bringing them into the world simply to kill them as soon as possible to eat them. So if I could wave that magic wand, that's what I would do. Wonderful. Well, Ros, what are you working on next? Um, I'm actually working on um, some ideas with birds. So um, I moved house a couple of years ago and I'm now on a fifth floor apartment. So... Um, although I swim every day still with the fish and the sharks, I've been noticing the bird life in this new area a lot more. Um, So I'm really interested in bird life for a couple of reasons. For one thing, not everybody has the opportunity to swim every day and get to know fish and sharks. But I think interactions with birds is probably one of the most common interactions that people in Australia experience. So I'm quite interested in exploring how we can attend more to that and engage more with that. Um, and I became particularly interested in the as spring came around this year because, of course, in spring we have all those... Um, stories about swooping magpies. So I became very interested in magpies and how we represent that particular um, in, uh, problematic interaction <laughs> between birds and people. So I've been writing a little bit about that. Wonderful. Well, where can people find out more about your work? I think the simplest way is to just look for my name on the UTS website. So if you just go to University Technology Sydney and put my name in the search box, you'll find a list of my publications. Wonderful. Well, Roz, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. Now, you can also find us on the internet. We're at knowing underscore animals on Twitter. We're at knowing animals on Facebook. We've got an Instagram feed. And also, we dearly love reviews on iTunes. Reviews are very, very important to the economy of uh, iTunes. It helps move the podcast up in the findability stakes and therefore it makes it easier for other people to find us and learn all about animals. So please do think about leaving a review. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D dot com.